All right. So today we are going to start on uh, 1.4. Anybody? Before we get started, with that does anybody have any questions on 1.2 or 1.3? Uh, anything they've come across in the homework uh, before we get started? Well, for those that were here during the lecture, anyway. All right, so 1.4, we're going to start talking about continuity and one-sided limits. So we kind of defined a limit as something uh, that's approaching from both sides, and it has to be approaching the same place from both sides. Now we're going to really get away from that definition and say, well, what if we only look at it from the left-hand side, or what if we only look at it from the right-hand side? Is it going to a specific value? And if that's the case, then we can get what's called a one-sided limit. So we want to determine continuity at a point and continuity on an, a complete open interval. We want to determine one-sided limits and continuity on a closed interval. Uh, we're going to use some properties of continuity, and then we're going to understand and use the IVT, the Intermediate Value Theorem. Now, we have used the Intermediate Value Theorem before in pre-cal, so that should be a concept that's not too difficult to grasp. Hopefully, uh, if you don't remember it, it'll come back to you when we start talking about it. So continuity at a point. So in math, the term continuous has much the same meaning as it does everywhere else. You know, it just means that there's no interruption in the graph when you, when you graph it, okay? Uh, traditionally, when you're in school, the rule is if you can draw the graph without having to move your, you know, remove your pencil from the paper, then it's continuous, okay? Same deal here. So we're going to say that if we have a graph that's unbroken at some x value of c, uh, and there are no holes, no jumps, and no gaps, then yes, it's continuous, okay? Now remember, when we talk about at C, we're going to say at C a lot in this class, right? At C just means some given X value. Does it, we don't know what it is, it's just some unknown, but it is an X value always, okay? So here we've got a figure. We've got three different examples. In this first function, notice that F of C, if we plug C in, we have a hole, which means it's not defined. Okay, that's not continuous. Obviously, if I'm drawing this and I come here, I have to pick, pick my pencil up and go over that hole, right? So that's not continuous. The second one, we have an example where the limit doesn't exist because we're approaching two different values from the left and from the right. And remember that by definition, the limit doesn't exist when that happens, okay? So if the limit doesn't exist, we also obviously have a, a jump and it's not continuous. And in the last case, we have the limit exists, the function exists, it has a value, but the value is not where the limit is. Therefore, there's still a hole, but this is okay, this is okay. They just, you, when you, sometimes when you put them together, you get, you get still discontinuity, okay? So, we're going to basically say anytime we've got f of c undefined, the limit not existing, or the limit does exist and f of c exists, but they're not the same. Those three situations are when we have discontinuities. Okay? Whether they're removable, whether they're uh, non-removable is not part of this, just the fact that there is a discontinuity there. Right? So if none of these three conditions is true, then it's continuous. We can Obviously, the limit's going to exist everywhere. Obviously, f of c is defined everywhere and obviously they're equal to each other, okay? <clears throat> so here's the actual definition of continuity. This is the calculus definition of continuity. A function is continuous at the point C when f of C is defined, the limit exists, and the limit is equal to f of C. A function is continuous on an open interval when the function is continuous at every point in the interval, okay? Not necessarily at the end points, because it's an open interval, right? When we have these parentheses, that denotes an open interval. The endpoints are not included. If a function is continuous on the entire real number line, then it's uh, everywhere continuous. I don't know why we feel the need to say that, but if it's continuous everywhere, then it's everywhere continuous, okay? So let's consider some open interval. We're gonna call it I. In this class, anytime we have an open interval, it's always going to be I. Uh, and it's going to have C in it. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean I have an open interval including C? 
Somebody give me an example of an open interval and a C that's included in it. Anybody? Can anybody give me an interval? From here to here? Some number to some other number? Nobody? It's not a trick. Give, somebody give me a number. Zero to 10. Zero to 10. Ah, fantastic. Open interval from zero to 10. Okay? That's I. That contains a real number C. So give me a C that's in the interval from zero to 10. Five. Doesn't have to be in the middle. Could be any number, right? It could be 1.3. Still a real number, still in the interval. That's all this is saying. Okay? We've got an open interval that contains a real number. So if a function is defined on this interval, except possibly at that value of c, and f is not continuous at c, then it's said to have a discontinuity there. Okay? Discontinuities fall into two categories. We've talked a little bit about these, removable and non-removable. Now, a removable discontinuity uh, is called removable because we can make it continuous by appropriately defining f of c. We'll redefine it. We'll basically plug the hole. And the way we've done it before, we saw it last time, was by canceling things out. If we have a rational expression, and we have zero in the denominator, if we can cancel out the factor that gives us that zero, that's a removable discontinuity. If we can't factor it out and cancel it out, then that's going to be a non-removable discontinuity. Okay? <clears throat> Here are three examples, the same three examples, right? Which of these are removable? Don't look at the fact that it says it on there. Just look at the graph. Do you think we can plug the hole? Yeah. By definition, holes can be plugged. Okay. If it's just a hole, we can plug that. A gap, on the other hand, is there any way to plug the gap? Not really. Okay. Here, we have a hole. Can we plug a hole? Yeah, we can plug that. So. By looking at them, you can tell whether they're removable or not because it's just going to be a, just a spot, not a gap. Okay. So let's look at four functions and discuss the continuity of each one of them. 1 over x, is it continuous, first off, over the entire real number line? Is there anywhere where it has a discontinuity? How do we know? Well, I told you just a second ago, if there's any number that makes the denominator go to zero, there's going to be a discontinuity of some kind. So, what can I plug in to make the denominator go to zero? Zero. So there's obviously a discontinuity at zero. Is there any way to plug that discontinuity? The only way we know how to plug that is to factor everything and try to cancel common factors out. Is there any way to cancel that x out? No, because I have nothing on the top to cancel it with, right? Therefore, is it removable? No. All right? What about the second one? x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. What value gives me a discontinuity? What value gives me 0 in the denominator? x equals 1, right? Now, if you can't see this in your head, just automatically say, whatever the denominator is, equals 1. or equals zero, I should say. Pardon me. Broken tick. There we go. So x equals 1, obviously, is, is the discontinuity. Now the question is, is there any way to factor the top so that we can cancel a common factor out? Yeah, x squared minus 1 is the difference of squares, right? So I can factor that as what? x plus 1 and x minus 1. 
and that's over x minus 1. So we can see that the x minus 1's are going to cancel out, leaving us with just x plus 1. Thus, we have plugged the hole, right? So that was a removable discontinuity that we have removed. All right, what about c? c is a piecewise function. How do we determine continuity of a piecewise function? Does anybody know? I don't know that we talked about this. We've talked about it in pre-cal when you had to learn to graph piecewise functions, but we only know whether they're continuous if they meet, right? Where are they supposed to meet at? They should meet at zero, right? Because that's where this one goes from negative infinity to zero. This one goes from zero to positive infinity. So if the two functions independently are obviously polynomial, therefore independently they're both continuous, for the whole entire piecewise function to be continuous, they have to meet at that point. So we evaluate at the meet point. So what do I get if I plug in x equals 0? I get 1, right? What do I get if I plug in 0 in the second one? I get 1. Therefore, they both have the same y value. Therefore, they meet. Therefore, it's continuous. Okay? That one may be a little less obvious than others, but that's how we do piecewise functions. Of course, if you've got a graphing calculator, you can graph both of them and see if they meet at the same place without having to evaluate them. All right, what about y equals sine x? Well, most of y'all just got out of trig or have taken trig recently. Is sine a continuous function? Is there any holes in sine? It's just sinusoid, right? It just keeps on going. There's no holes in it. It's continuous. So sine has a continuity. Now what about sine x over x? Does that have a discontinuity? I have a denominator. Is there anything that will make my denominator go to 0? Zero? 0, right? So it would have a discontinuity at 0. And it would not be pluggable because I have nothing I can cancel out. Therefore, it would be a non-removable discontinuity. Does that make sense? All right, so. Oh, a nice little calculus meme. How it feels trying to understand math. Do y'all feel like that sometimes? I've never, <laughs> I think it's cute because uh, I don't, I love math. I, I've, I've always been a math person. I'm the kind of y'all hate. You know that you know, if you, when people struggle with math, people that don't struggle with math are like their enemy. It's like some kind of unspoken, you know, sworn enemy statement thing. But uh, this cracks me up because I I would read that book for fun, right? So I, I wouldn't cry about it. But that's just me. I love the the fact that the dad is laughing con uncontrollably up there. He's just like, <laughs> like he's he's probably an engineer or something. And he's like, you're gonna learn this. I, have, I would like to say I have never tried to teach my daughter calculus, so she's only five. That won't come until she's like seven. So I have taught her pre-cal. That's true. She knows the quadratic formula. So, oh, I heard a joke. The other day. This is a good joke. Y'all are going to hate it. Uh, what do you feed a baby parabola? Quadratic formula. Parabolas are quadratic. It's formula. Ah, it's a dad joke and a math dad joke at that. I'm a math dad, so that works. That's terrible. It is terrible, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. One-sided limit. Y'all, y'all don't know the the person I learned calculus from. I learned calculus from Mr. Tyler, who was the uh, the math department chair here uh, back. Uh, I guess he retired in like oh six or so, uh, but. He had the worst humor in the history of humor. Plus, he was a, a Vandy fan. Uh, he got his uh, master's from Vandy, so he was all the time make these just really bad, like football Vandy being good jokes, you know, which they're not. But anyway, y'all are lucky to have me because my jokes are kind of funny. One sided limits and continuity on a closed interval. So we've talked about. Continuity on an open interval. Now we're going to talk about one-sided limits, what we're doing from one side, 
and what happens if they're closed interval. So to understand continuity on a closed interval, you have to look at the different type of limit called a one-sided limit. We only care about what it's approaching from either the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Okay? So here, the limit from the right means that x is approaching c from values greater than c. Okay? We're not saying that we're going to the right. We're saying that we're coming from the right. Okay? So a right-hand limit is what happens when we're getting smaller. Left-hand limit means we're coming from the left towards the value, so we're getting bigger. Okay? So here we're talking about the right-handed limit would be what we're approaching from this way. The left-handed limit would be the approach from this way. Okay? The way we write this, a right-handed limit would be as x approaches c with a plus sign. I don't know if you can see this very well, but there's a plus sign denoting that we're coming from the right, from the positive side. Okay? It doesn't mean that we're going positive, it just means we're coming from the positive side. If we want to go from the left, that's going to have a minus sign. Okay? Now, you have to be really careful, particularly when you're first learning these, because you're going to get thrown things like this. What's the limit of x squared minus 3 as x approaches negative 3? negative 3 from the left, okay? Or the limit as x approaches 3 from the left. Now, a lot of times, people see 3 and a minus sign, and they just assume negative 3, and they plug negative 3 in, okay? That's not how it works. That minus sign just tells you that it's a left-handed limit, and we're just talking about what's it approaching from the left-hand side, okay? So be aware that it's easy to make that mistake, particularly when you're first learning limits. All right, so one-sided one limits are particularly useful uh, when we're taking the limits involving radicals. For example, the limit as x approaches 0 from the right-hand side of the nth root of x. Why is it important to put that right-handed limit? Think about this. How would we solve this? The limit as x approaches 0. The way we know how to do it, right, is to plug in 0, and we get the nth root of 0 is 0, right? That's not technically true for a radical. We're, we're fixing to find an error in that, uh, that math. Because think about this. What if we were making a table? Right? Remember, when we do a table, we start with 0 in the middle, and we've got values that are getting smaller and smaller, and we've got values that are getting bigger and bigger towards zero. What's, what numbers are less than zero? Negative numbers, right? Can I plug any negative number in to a square root function and get a value out? No, that means that the entire left-hand side of my table is empty, which means I have no limit coming from this direction. And remember, for a limit to exist, I have to be going to the same value from both sides, right? So by this, I have no left-handed limit. A, a, an even radical evaluated at zero has no limit. And that's why when we talked about this, we defined that n had to be odd or c had to be a positive number for this rule to be effect where we could just plug a value in. Okay, if you're not if you don't remember that, make sure you go back and look over that radical rule on 1.3, I believe, uh, maybe 1.4. But at, at the boundary, you're going to have an issue because we don't have we've only got one limit. Now, if you were to graph square root of x, square root of x looks like this. Right? That's one of those basic functions that we learned in pre-cal. So I can see my right-hand limit is approaching 0. My left hand, I don't even have a left hand. Right? So what's the actual limit? What is the limit of the square root of x as x approaches 0? We know from the right it's 0, right? 
We know from the left, we don't even have one. So what happens if I don't have one on one side and I do have one on one side? Does not exist, right? So this limit, D and E, okay? Now, find the limit of f of x equals 4 minus x squared root as x approaches negative 2. So we're talking about the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right, so it's a right-hand limit, of square root of 4 minus x squared. Now, for all practical purposes, we can plug that value in, get an answer, and it's either going to be the right or left-handed limit. Okay? It'll either be the limit, the right, or the left limit. If I plug in negative 2, what happens? Negative 2 squared is... What's negative 2 squared? 4? Right, 4 minus 4. 0, square root of 0, 0. Since I got the square root of 0, I know that it's the boundary, right? And I know that it's a square root function. It's going to be jumping to the right. Therefore, it's only going to have that right-handed limit. It's not going to have a left-handed limit. Therefore, the right-handed limit is 0. We can still plug it in. We just have to recognize that we can only take a one-sided limit at that boundary. Okay. If I were just to ask you, as x approaches negative 2, that would be does not exist. Okay? So you have to be aware of whether or not you've got that plus sign, that minus sign, or not. This is what that graph looks like. Notice, at positive 2, what kind of limit do we have? What direction is it coming from? It's coming from the left. So we only have a left-handed limit at positive 2. So at negative 2, we only have a left. At positive 2, we only have a right. But anywhere in between, we have a, a full limit. There's no, you know, the limit as x approaches negative 1, I can just plug it in and get a value. It's not on the boundary. So we're really only talking about those boundary points when we're doing these. Now, one side limits can be used to investigate the behavior of something called a step function. Anybody ever used step functions before or seen them? We might have talked about them in pre-cal, I don't remember. Uh, but the most popular step function is called a greatest integer function. And it's denoted by these little double bar brackets. And basically what it's saying is if you take the greatest integer function of some real number, we're just basically going to say, well, what's the greatest integer such that n is less than this value? So like if I want to know the, the, the greatest integer of 2.5, What's the biggest number that's less than 2.5 that's still an integer? It's 2. Okay. Negative 2.5, what's the biggest integer that is still less than negative 2.5? We're negative now, so we're talking about going from negative 2.5 to negative 3. Remember, we're always going to the left on the real number line. The graph of this, well, we don't have, so I'll show you what the graph looks like.
that's not right. It's like this, like this, like this, like this. Filled in, filled in, filled in, filled in, filled in, filled in. Looks like this, and then you can see why they're called step functions, right? They are non-continuous because it goes from here to here with a hole up, with a hole up, with a hole up, with a hole up, right? So that's what a greatest integer function looks like. Notice that we can only to do at those, at the actual integers, at negative four, we've got a gap, right? We've got a jump discontinuity. At jump discontinuities, we can only talk about right or left-hand limits. We can't talk about the regular limit because obviously the limit doesn't exist because they're going to different points. That's kind of the definition of a jump discontinuity. So this is a good way of seeing uh, how we can use one-sided limits in that, in that context. So when the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right, then the limit doesn't exist. So we're going to use this as theorem 1.10. Let f be a function. Let c and l be real numbers. The limit of f of x as x approaches c is l if and only if the right-hand limit is l and the left-hand limit is l. Okay, so that being said, if I tell you that the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x is 7, and the limit as x approaches 2 from the left is 7, then what is the limit as x approaches 2 of the function? 7, right? 7 from the left, 7 from the right, therefore the entire limit is 7. Now if I were to tell you that the limit as x approaches 2 from the left is 8, then what would the limit be? D and E, right? Because they're going to different values. Does that make sense? All right. Now make sure you stop me. If something doesn't make sense. So, one of the good things about one-sided limits is it allows you to extend the definition of continuity over to closed intervals. Because now we don't worry about what's happening at the end points because we can talk about just a right-handed limit or just a left-handed limit, right? We don't have to have the other side of the interval. So we can close the interval and talk about what's going on at that one point specifically. So, a function is continuous on a closed interval when it's continuous on all the interior points, okay? And it exhibits one -sided, uh, a one-sided limit at the boundaries, at the endpoints, okay? Or we can say a function is continuous on a closed interval. Notice when we say closed interval, we use brackets on A, B instead of the parentheses. So on a closed interval from A to B, when F is continuous on the entire open interval from A to B, and the right-hand limit is equal to F of A, and the left-handed limit is equal to F of B. So we're talking about at A, we have a right-handed limit, and it's at that point. At B, we have a left-handed limit, and it's at that point. There's no jump at the boundaries. Okay, We can't have a jump discontinuity at the boundaries, or else we're not continuous. All right? Does anybody, everybody see what I'm talking about there? If this were open and the point was down here, it would be defined, but it wouldn't be defined as the limit, right? It's not the right-hand limit. So it actually has to approach, the function has to approach the value of f of a. Over here, it has to approach the value of f of b. So. 1 minus x squared square root. Is it continuous? If it is continuous, where is it continuous? Is it continuous only on an open interval? Is it continuous on a closed interval? What do y'all think? Any, uh, any ideas? With the square root, which tells us that more than likely there's some issue, right? There's something that's going to keep us from saying it's continuous everywhere. 
we can always talk about domain, right? Everybody remember how to find the domain of a square root function? Does anybody remember how to find the domain of a square root function from pre-cal? The domain is anywhere that the argument is greater than or equal to zero, right? We know we can't have any number that makes the square root argument be negative. Can't take the square root of a negative number. So we move the x squared over and we say one has to be one has to be greater than or equal to x squared. Take the square root of both sides. X has to be less than one, greater than negative one. So that gives us our interval right there from negative one to positive one. Now, it's actually brackets, right? Because it's including. So the question is, does f of negative 1 equal the limit as f of x approaches negative 1? Does f of 1 equal the limit of f of x? Or, yeah, f of x as we're approaching 1. We can just plug those in and see, and we get Yes, those limits do exist. So, all this is exactly what I said. The limit is zero for both of them, so we know it exists. Questions? Comments? Concerns? All right. So, properties of continuity. We have uh, if b is a real number and f and g are continuous at x equals c, then the functions listed below are also continuous. So, multiplying a function by a scalar doesn't change its continuity. So, I can multiply a number through an entire function that's continuous and I'll still have a continuous function. If I add two continuous functions together, I still have a continuous function. Okay? If I multiply two functions together, I still have a continuous function as long as they are both continuous. And then lastly, if I divide two functions that are continuous, as long as the bottom function does not go to zero, then I still have a continuous function. Okay? So the list below gives us some functions that we've looked at so far that are continuous everywhere in their domain. Polynomials. Why? What is a polynomial? But just the sum of individual continuous functions, right? Rational expressions. That's just the division of two continuous functions. Radicals. Well, they're not what we just did, but we do know that radicals are continuous uh, everywhere in their domain. And then all the trig functions we know are all continuous because we've graphed them recently. So by combining theorem 111 with this summary, now we can create a, a huge amount of functions that are continuous. So if I ask you, is this function continuous everywhere on its domain. Is it? Is 2x squared plus 3x? That's just a polynomial, right? That's continuous. 5x plus 7 over x uh, plus 3 is continuous on its domain because it's a rational expression. Now, Negative 3 is not in the domain, so be aware of that. But on its domain, it is continuous. 
tangent is continuous, secant of 3x is continuous because they're trig functions. And all I'm doing is adding or subtracting a bunch of these together. Therefore, the entire function has to be continuous on its domain. That makes sense? We're just adding a bunch of stuff together that we know is continuous. Therefore, the whole thing is. x plus sine x, 3 times the tangent of x, x squared plus 1 over cosine x. These are all examples of how we can combine the functions we already know and combine them and make new functions that we also know are continuous on their domain. You've got to throw that in there. Where is, where is this f of x undefined? Test your trig knowledge. Where does cosine x equal 0? Pi over 2? Anywhere else? 3 pi over 2? Anywhere else? That's just on the unit circle, right? Remember, we can always add full circles and get the rest of the answers. So that would be <coughs> undefined anywhere pi over 2 plus 2 pi n or 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi n. All right. The next theorem, which is a consequence of, the, uh, of theorem 1.5 from before, allows you to determine the com continuity of comp uh, compositions or composite functions, such as the sine of 3x, the square root of x squared plus 1, or the tangent of 1 over x. Okay? And what it says is if g is continuous at c, and f is continuous at g of c, then f of g of x uh, is continuous. The, comp the comp composition of the two function is continuous. For example, here, the interior function is 3x. The outside function is sine. So that's the composite function. That's f of g of x. So we're going to say, if g, the inner function, is continuous at, you know, whatever value, x equals 5. That just gives you 3 times 5 is 15. Yeah, of course, it's continuous there. It's just a regular function. Then the sine of 3 times 5 is continuous because it works. All right. It's not really a theorem we use that much. Don't worry about the math speak of it. Just be able to recognize that these composite functions hold this same kind of continuity uh, ability to, to, to remain continuous. All right, so we're going to look at these functions independently. Tangent function, f of x equals 10x is undefined at pi over 2 plus any multiple of pi, right? That's where the, we had those asymptotes when we graphed tangent. Because these represents vertical asymptotes, which are obviously jump discontinuities, then that's the only places on there that were discontinuous. So all other points, it's continuous, which means on its domain, it's continuous everywhere because pi over 2 plus n pi is not in the domain of tangent. So if you were to look at it and write out what is the, where is it continuous, you'd have to do a bunch of little intervals, right? This interval, and this interval, and this interval, an infinite number of intervals. And it would look like that. That's the graph of tangent, right? All right, what about 1 over x? We know that 1 over x is continuous everywhere except for at x equals 0. Okay? We're talking about sine of 1 over x. So since it's undefined at 1 over x at x equals 0, then the sine function is continuous for all real values of x except at x equals 0. Graphing it looks like this.
notice that it's a sine function, right? So you know it's going to bounce back and forth up and down between negative 1 and 1. The limit does not exist at x equals 0 because it's jumping back and forth. It never approaches any value. It's always up and down, up and down, up and down, and up and down. Okay? So g is continuous on the intervals from negative infinity to 0 and from 0 to infinity because we knew that 1 over x is undefined at 0. So if you can look at that interior function and say, well, where is the interior function undefined? Then the entire composition has to be undefined at that point as well. Now, an interesting consequence of this If we look at C, we've got x times sine of 1 over x, okay, not defined at 0, and then we've got 0 equals 0. So we're going to use some, we're going to use the squeeze theorem. Recognize that x times the sine of 1 over x has to be between, well, what a sine have to be between. Sign of anything. I can't be higher than what and lower than what. Negative 1 and 1, right? It has to be between negative 1 and 1. Therefore, x times sine of 1 over x has to be between negative x and positive x. Okay, does that make sense? Therefore, I can say, well, the limit of the absolute value of negative square root or negative uh, absolute value of x is 0. And the limit of absolute value of x is also 0. Therefore, if this is always between these two functions and they have the same limit, then by the squeeze theorem, this has to have the exact same limit. And that limit is 0. Now, if that limit is 0 and we defined x equals uh, 0 as giving us 0, if x equals 0, then we get 0. Therefore, the limit is 0, f of x equals 0, the limit and the function are defined at the same point, therefore it is continuous. So for that one, we have con continuity over the entire real number line. Does everybody see that? Vaguely? Partly? Mostly? Hopefully. All right. IVT. This is what we've done before. We've done the intermediate value theorem. What it says, if f is continuous on some closed interval where f of a and f of b are not equal to each other, where the endpoints are not equal, okay, they don't go to the same point, and k is some number between f of a and f of b. Now remember, when I'm talking about f of a and f of b, I'm talking about y values, right? A and B are X values, so A gives me F of A. B gives me F of B. There's some K between A and B that's going to give us some value on between A and B. There's a number between F of A and F of B that gives us some number between A and B. Now, we use this in pre-cal to verify that there were zeros of functions. If I said I have a function and I want to prove that there's a zero on some interval, then I tested one side and I get a positive value. I test the other side, I get a negative value. And if the function is continuous and I go from a positive value to a negative number, I have to cross zero, right? That forces us to have a zero somewhere in there. It doesn't tell us where it is, but it does tell us that it exists. This is the same thing, but now we're saying it could be, k could be any number. It doesn't have to be zero. When we did it before, we were always looking for a zero. Now we can look for some other value, okay? It tells you that at least one number exists, but it doesn't tell you what it is. Uh, there are theorems called existence theorems that let you prove what the value actually is, uh, but 
the IVT just states that for a continuous function, if x takes on all the values between a and b, then f of x must take on all the values from f of a to f of b. Okay, the y values have to all be there. If all of the x values in the interval are there, then all of the y values between them have to be there as well. As an example of the application of this, consider a person's height. Okay, a girl is five feet tall on her 13th birthday and five foot seven on her 14th birthday. For any height between five feet and five foot seven, you should be able to determine there's an age somewhere in there. She had to be some age between 13 and 14, right? There has to be somewhere in there where she's that height. So I'm given, my X's are 13 and 14. So from 13 to 14, she went from five foot tall to five foot seven. So my Y values are five and five seven. So there's some, every value between five and five seven, five six, five five, five four, five three and three quarters, five two and one eighth, all of those values have to be between 13 and 14, sometime between 13 and 14. Does that make sense? You know, see what I'm saying here? All right, and this is, this is logical because growth is continuous. It's not like she was like, I'm five foot, I'm five seven, now I'm five three later, and then I'm five eight, and then I'm back down to five one, and you know, that's just not how, it's not how height works, okay? So as long as it's a continuous function, uh, and doesn't abruptly change from one value to another, it, it never is like, and then like I woke up yesterday and I was five foot tall and today I woke up and I'm six three. You know, that would be weird. So the IVT guarantees the existence of at least one number, possibly more. Because what happens if you've got a continuous function that does go up and down, right? Then that's, that's okay. It can come back down and go back up. And it may cross my value more than one time. And that's okay, that's fine. So a function that is not continuous doesn't necessarily exhibit all of this because what happens if I have a jump discontinuity? Then I have a whole group of k values, y values that are not represented on this graph, right? Therefore, that's why the IVT has to require that it's a continuous function. If it's not continuous, we've got a jump. We can use it, like I said, to find the zeros of functions. Uh, for example, use the intermediate value theorem to show that the polynomial has a zero in the interval from zero to one. So that means if it has a zero, that means that somewhere it has to be higher and somewhere it has to be lower so that it crosses, right? It has to cross the x-axis to have a zero. It could look like this. It could look like this. It could look like this. There may be more than one. But the IVT will guarantee that if I start positive and end negative, start positive, end negative, or start negative and end positive, I have to have a zero somewhere in there. So all we have to do is plug in our two values and see what happens. So if I plug in zero, zero cubed plus two times zero minus one gives me negative one. It's a negative number. If I plug in positive one, I get one cubed plus two is three minus one is two. I get a positive number. Because I started from a negative value and went to a positive value, I had to cross zero. Did everybody see that? That's, this is one of the, this is a really important concept. I started negative, I went positive, I have to cross the x-axis at some point. Not only that, I can guarantee that since this is negative one and this is positive two, that any value from negative one to two, I can find in there. There has to be some x value that gives me y equals zero, but there also has to be y equals one. 1.5, 1.75, there has to be y values associated with all of those, okay? Now, we can determine one of the, the methods that we can do if we want to actually find the zero is something called the bisection method. So I went from zero to one, right? 
from 0 to 1. That doesn't tell me where C is. It just tells me that it's got a Y value of 0. I know there's a Y value of 0. So, what if I were to take this and bisect this region? Then I would have 0 and a half, right? That would be a new interval. I could test 0 and a half and say, well, what happens if I plug in if I plug in 0, I get negative 1. I know that. What happens if I plug in half? Half cubed plus 2 times a half minus 1. Is that positive or negative? And then I can determine if it's still negative, then the 0 is not on that interval. It has to be on the other interval. So then I can test that, and I can bisect it and half it and try two more values and say, well, is this positive or is this negative? And once I, I can narrow it down enough, I can get an approximation. Now, this could be you know, a 40-step process, depending on how accurate you want to be, but it can be done repeatedly over and over and over again. We'll close in on that. So what I want to do is I want to find that. So we've got x cubed plus 2x minus 1. x cubed plus 2x minus 1. So x cubed minus 2x plus 1. And I know that that's an open interval. That's close to. At 0, we get negative 1 plus 2 is 1 plus 1. At 0, we get 1. It's minus. What? Y'all are not helping me. Plus 2x minus 1. I did it backwards. x cubed plus 2x minus 1. So f of 0 was negative 1. f of 1 was 2. So by the bisection method, we're going to start with, let's do 1 half. Okay? So we get 1 half cubed plus 2 times 1 half minus 1. Well, half of 2 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. 1 half cubed is a positive number. So I know that this is positive. So if I went from f of 0, which is negative, to f of 1 half, which is positive, that means that the 0 has to be between 0 and 1 half. Okay? Is that... Does that make sense? Does everybody see that that has to be the case? Because I can't guarantee anything from 1 half to 1 because they're both positive. So they're both above the x-axis. So now I know it's between 0 and 1 half. So let's try a quarter. So we've got 1 over 4 cubed plus 2 times a quarter minus 1. So that's 1 64th plus a half minus one. So is that positive or negative? A 64th and a half doesn't equal one, right? So it's got to be smaller than one. A number smaller than one minus one has to be a negative number. So this has to be less than zero. All right? So that's negative. That means it can't be between 0 and 1 fourth because both of those are negative. Therefore, it has to be between 1 fourth and 1 half. So now we have to pick a number between a quarter and a half. What would that be? Third? So 
that gives us 1 over 27 plus 2 thirds minus 1. Is that positive or negative? Well, 1 27th plus 2 thirds is less than 1, right? Less than 1 minus 1 has to be a negative number, so that's also negative. So now we know it has to be between 1 third and 1 half. Okay? I'm not going to go on from here. We're not going to keep going forever to find this value. But this is how you could do it. You just have to keep plugging in values between them and bisecting it so that you get little intervals and just keep testing them until you narrow it down to a value that's close enough for your personal preference. You know, maybe you need something within four digits or five digits or something like that. So, like I said, it might take you 40 iterations of this over and over again, but it can be done. It's an exhaustive method, but it is a method that works. All right, any questions on 1.4? All right, so let's talk about something a little bit easier, and that's infinite limits. So what we want to talk about is uh, being able to determine infinite limits from the left and the right, and we want to talk about sketching vertical asymptotes of graphs of functions. And the reason this is going to be easy is because we already know how to do this, right? We've done this before. So an infinite limit, basically let's look at a function, say 3 over x minus 2. Uh, from this graph, you can see that this function is decreasing without bound as x approaches 2, and it's increasing without bound as x approaches 2 from this direction, right? From the left it's going negative, from the right it's going positive. This was kind of the definition of a vertical asymptote when we did this in pre-cal, when we did this in Math 112. So you can see that there's no limit. The limit doesn't exist, right, because there's a jump discontinuity. But when we talk about limits from the right and from the left, we can talk a little bit less structured and talk about, well, obviously this is approaching negative infinity, and this is approaching positive infinity. So we can say that they have infinite limits, OK? So notice when you do a table, the exact same thing happens. As we approach 2 from the left, we get really big negative numbers. From the right, we get really big positive numbers. Okay? So from here on out, we're going to talk about right and left-handed limits as being possibly infinite. Okay? So the limit as x approaches negative 2 is negative infinity. The limit as x approaches 2 from the right is positive infinity. Okay? And what's the limit as x approaches 2? does not exist because one's going positive infinity, one's going negative infinity. That being said, what if I had a graph that the right-handed limit was going to infinity and the left-handed limit was going to infinity, both of them going to positive infinity? What would the limit be? We'll get to it. So. Infinity and negative infinity, everybody knows what these symbols are, right? One represents going to uh, positive infinity and negative infinity. They're not real numbers, right? Infinity is not a tangible value. It's a concept. Uh, they're just symbols. So a limit that increases or decreases without bound as x approaches c is called an infinite limit. Here's our nice math speak. So we're going to let f be a function that's defined at every real number in some open interval containing c except possibly at c, then the statement that the limit of f of x equals infinity as x approaches c means that for every m greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that f of x is greater than m whenever x minus c is less than delta. Also, the limit as it approaches uh, C equals negative infinity means that for every n less than 0, uh, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that f of x is less than n anywhere that x minus c is less than delta. 
Now, let's look at the positive version. Basically, all I'm saying is for every m greater than 0, okay, m's are all y values. Then if I pick some delta, then there exists somewhere on the graph that is greater than the m I picked. So let's say I come here and like m is this value. If I pick it, then there's some there's some function, some f of x greater than m somewhere in that delta. No matter what value of m I pick, no matter how high I go, there will always be somewhere higher, is all it's saying. Okay? And for the negative, I'm picking an n value that's down here. And no matter what n value I pick, there's somewhere on the graph that's lower. Somewhere in that interval. Okay? So this is not something you have to memorize. It's just something that makes sense logically when you think about it, not in terms of all this delta and m and n's. But if I tell you that no matter what value I pick for y, I can always find another y value greater than it somewhere close, then that tells me that it's an infinite limit. Okay. So this goes back to what we were just talking about a while ago. If they both approach positive infinity, then we can say is an infinite limit. So this, what's the limit of this function as x approaches 1? This one's going to infinity, this one's going to infinity, so I can say that the limit is infinity. Okay? Just the limit is 2. The limit as x approaches 1, I'm sorry. It is from the left and the right, therefore it is for the entire function. Now when they go to different ones, that's when the limit doesn't exist anymore, but the right-handed limits can be defined as positive or negative infinity. Right. Yes, yes, that's what I just said. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Hi. Right. We get to watch a video now. I get engrossed by these videos. They are awful. But you know how you get on YouTube and you just get down some rabbit hole and all of a sudden you're watching videos that your normal people shouldn't watch, right? This is this is this is kind of it. And that's about all I can take of that. So apparently a lot of math teachers in high school like to have their students
come up with you know creative little things like this, and then they put them on YouTube, and I feel bad for these parents, or for these when their parents, you know, and they have kids and their kids are finding these like, oh my God, mom, what were you doing? Were you trying to sing? You're not any good. But some of them are not bad, but some of them are awesome. Yes, I said awesome. Ooh, what's that one? Calculus Rhapsody? Hold on now. I hadn't heard this one. That's not too bad. We might revisit this one when we do differentials. I'll have to flag that for later. <laughs> All right. Vertical asymptotes. So if it were possible to extend the graphs here uh, toward positive and negative infinity, you'd see that each graph becomes arbitrarily close to the vertical line x equals 1. possible to send the graphs in figure one form towards positive and negative infinity, you would see that each graph becomes arbitrarily close to the vertical line. Well, negative one in this case. Uh, positive one and negative one in this case. These lines, these vertical lines are called vertical asymptotes. These are what happens when we have zero in the denominator, but no way to cancel out and have a plugged removable discontinuity. These are the non-removable discontinuities. Okay. So if f of x approaches infinity as x approaches c from the right or the left, then that line represents a vertical asymptote. Does that make sense? If we know that the limit goes to infinity, there has to be an asymptote there. All right. So in example one, note that each of these functions is a quotient and the vertical asymptote occurs at the number where the denominator is zero and we can't cancel it out. All right. So from here on out, we know that this is going to be the case. If we have a zero in the denominator that can't be canceled out, it's going to be a vertical asymptote. And it's at that point, there has to be a, a, either a positive or negative limit. Okay. So let f and g be continuous on an open interval containing c. If f of c is not equal to zero, if g of c is equal to zero, and there exists an open interval containing c such that g of x is not equal to zero, uh, for all of the x is not equal to c in that interval, then that graph has a vertical asymptote at x equals c. Did y'all catch that? All I'm saying is, as long as g is 0, but f is not, then there exists some interval where g is not 0 for all of the x is not equal to c. So it's defined everywhere else except at that g of uh, x being 0, then there's a vertical x asymptote wherever that 0 is at, whatever x value uh, gives us a g of x equals 0. Okay, It's basically the exact same thing I've said 14 times already, just more complicated. All right. So where are the vertical asymptotes? Where's the vertical asymptote for f of x equals 1 over 2 times x plus 1? f of x is 1, g of x is 2 times x plus 1. So where does 2x, 2 times x plus 1, where does that go to 0? x equals what? Yep. 
Yeah, negative one, right? X equals negative one. Therefore, the vertical asymptote, X equals negative one. It's a vertical line at X equals negative one. What about X squared minus one? What happens when that goes to zero? What is X going to be equal to? And notice it can't be factored, right? So I can't cancel anything out. So where is X squared minus one equal to zero? At one, anywhere else? Negative one. So at X equals one and at X equals negative one, I have vertical asymptotes. Cotangent X. This doesn't look like a fraction, right? Or does it? Can I write cotangent X as a fraction? Yeah, I can. What is it going to be? Cosine over sine. So where does sine X equal zero? That's the Y value. So that happens at what? Zero and pi? Not just zero and pi, but zero plus n pi, pi over and over again, right? So x equals zero plus n pi, zero pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, five pi, six pi, negative one pi, negative two pi, negative three pi. So notice how that first graph looks. We, we determined that there was only one asymptote, and it was at negative 1, and that's what the function looks like. The second one had positive 1 and negative 1. That's what that function looks like. And then cotangent has it at every pi. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. Okay? Questions? Comments? No? All right, so properties of infinite limits. If the limit of f is infinity as x approaches c, and the limit of g is l as x approaches c, okay, so recognize the difference. f is an infinite limit, but g is not. If we add an infinite limit and a non infinite limit together, we get infinity. Just like if we were to add infinity plus 4. What's infinity plus 4? Infinity. Right? If you add something to infinity, you just get infinity. Same with the limits. If you multiply them, you get infinity. Unless you multiply by a negative number. If L happens to be negative, then you would get negative infinity. Okay? And then the quotient... This is the interesting one. What do we get if we divide a real number, L, by a really, really, really big number? What's 4 divided by 10? 4 tenths, right? That's kind of silly. What's 4 divided by 100? 4 one hundredths. Smaller number, right? What's 4 divided by 1,000? Four thousandths, a smaller number. So the bigger the number you divide by, the smaller the number you get. So by that rationale, it makes sense that if I divide by infinity, which is the biggest possible number, then I get zero, which is the smallest possible whole number. Okay? Similar properties will hold for one-sided limits and for functions for which the limit uh, approaches negative infinity instead of positive infinity. So if we were to talk about, if this were negative infinity and this were L, what would negative infinity plus a number be? Negative infinity, right? What would negative infinity times a positive number be? Still negative infinity, right? And then negative infinity times a negative number, that would give us positive infinity, okay? And then the quotient is still going to be zero regardless, all right? So, say you're given the limit of 1 plus 1 over x squared as x approaches 0. Because we can look at these independently. We know that the limit of 1 is just 1, right? It's a constant. 
And we know that the limit of 1 over x squared has to be infinity. How do we know that? Well, we can graph it, of course. But the easier way is plug in x equals 0, 1 over 0. It's an undefined indeterminate form. But from here on out, when we do limits, 1 divided by infinity is going to give us 0, and 1 divided by 0 is going to give us infinity. Okay, So that's something we need to keep in our brain. When we're taking the limits, if we divide by 0, it blows up to infinity. Because what is division by 0? It's a vertical asymptote. right? That was kind of what we defined a vertical asymptote. And what happens at a vertical asymptote? Limit goes to either positive or negative infinity. All right? So depending on whether it's a positive or negative value, you may get negative infinity. But this one is positive infinity, so 1 plus infinity equals infinity. x squared plus 1 over cotangent of pi over x. If we're approaching 1 from the right-hand side, we can just plug that in. 1 plus 1 is 2, so we know that the top is 2. But we're approaching 1, we get the cotangent of pi which we know is a vertical asymptote. So we have to ask ourselves, what direction are we coming from? Since we're coming from the left, we know that cotangent rises. So if we're coming from the left, then we know that we're, that's backwards. Cotangent falls, right? Tangent rises. So cotangent falls. So from the left, we're going negative. Therefore, it's negative infinity. So what's a real number divided by negative infinity? Zero. Right? If you divide by positive infinity, you get zero. If you divide by negative infinity, you still get zero. Because zero has no sign. And then three times the cotangent of x, as x approaches zero from the right, same deal. We know that three is three. Cotangent, like I said, it falls. So since we're going from the right, that means we're going to positive infinity. So a positive number times positive infinity is positive infinity. x squared plus 1 over x. If we plug in 0, we get 0 plus 1 over 0, so we get 1 over infinity. But the question is, we're talking about a left-handed limit. Is it positive or negative? And 1 over x is one of those functions that you should know off the top of your head what it looks like. 1 over x looks like this. So from the right-hand side, it goes to infinity. From the left-hand side, it goes to negative infinity. Therefore, we're talking about 0 plus negative infinity, which obviously equals negative infinity. Okay? All right. Questions? Oh, we finished a little early. All right. So this finishes up our entire chapter one. So at this point, we should be able to do all the homework. It's not due, of course, till next Wednesday. Uh, our first test will be Thursday next week. So you've got a week to prepare for uh, test one. Remember, we're going to cover a little bit of material before we take test one. So we're going to do, I think it's 2.3 that we're going to cover. 1, 2.1, 2.2, 2, yes, 2.3. Uh, so, be aware, we'll cover that material, then we'll take the test, uh, and then from here on out, uh, all of the testing days will be exclusively testing days where we can do one and then make up a second one, okay? Any questions on anything? All right, then we will see y'all.